and there was also taken advantage of a bit of uh, of some fixed rates through some non bank lenders. Yep. So the non the, the, that three percent buffer that I talked about is really only been a, it's only applicable for for deposit taking institutions. Yep. So some of them, especially in the current environment where rates are expected to decrease, not increase, they are um, they are choosing to take a different approach as far as their buffers are concerned. And there's there's one in one in particular that I've used has a five year fixed rate, which you know maybe you normally might not necessarily recommend, but there are ways there are ways around this which I can talk through if you want to, Bushy. But on that five year fixed rate, they don't have any buffer. So if you take their five year fixed rate, which is currently pretty much in line with variable rates, yep. there's no buffer. So instead of having to afford the loan at nine percent, you're basically affording the loan at six percent, and that gives you a like significant amount of additional borrowing capacities. Welcome to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, the leading weekly show to help you unlock your full self, health and wealth potential. I'm your host, Bushy Martin, and each week I go deep with the best investors, experts, leaders and founders to find out what it takes to break free from the grind, discover freedom and live by design. Subscribe now and join me and get invested in the life you really want. Let's get started. Hi, Fred Advitus. How important do you think your financing and loans are to your property success? Are you struggling to borrow enough to secure your next property or refinance your home loan? And you just don't know what you can do about it or what your options are? And how can you maximise your buying capacity and purchasing price power while minimising your costs as well as your risks? If any or all of these questions are of interest to you, then you've landed in the right place because they're all very closely related. Sadly for many, home loan lending or property investment borrowings are assumed to be just a means to an end because all banks are the same and it's just about getting the lowest rate loan because that's all the banks and a lot of brokers bang on about, right? Wrongity, wrong, wrong, wrong. As we constantly reiterate, property's a game of finance and an elite team sport. Getting the right borrowing strategy and structure and the resulting loan to suit your specific needs will make or break your capacity, your cost and your risk, as well as your stress levels. So to optimise all this, you need to be working with a savvy mortgage broker who has the accumulated wealth of wisdom, experience and expertise to craft the best financing solution to suit your specific needs and goals. Because when it comes to loans, the devil's in the detail and the experience required to fully understand the ins and outs of over 40 different banks and lenders, policies and processes, along with getting your head around over 2,000 different loan products, takes years to master. And in this regard, the revolving door of bank staff and Johnny-come-lately brokers who might have been spray painters or hairdressers yesterday and brokers today, is just not going to cut it if you're really serious about setting yourself up financially and achieving sustainable success in property. Let me give you a, a couple of quick examples to work your appetite. As I've mentioned before, there's over a 55% variation across the banks in terms of how much I'll let you borrow. In very simple terms, this means that one bank may allow you to purchase a property of about 500 grand, while one of the others can allow you to secure a $775,000 property based on exactly the same financial position. And this initial $275,000 difference has the potential to add an extra $790,000 to your equity in 20 years' time, assuming that both value properties grow at the same rate. Now, similarly, when it comes to rate versus cost, a low-rate loan often ends up being much more expensive long-term because when you add in ingoing, ongoing and outgoing fees, along with the impacts of offset accounts and other debt reduction features, a high-rate loan can often end up being lower cost to the tune of tens of thousands and sometimes even hundreds of thousands of dollars. So focus on true cost, not initial rate, as low rate loans often end up becoming what I call shagulator loans that end up costing you a lot more over time. Now, one of the other critical elements to consider when getting a loan to buy property is your risk. As we're going to discuss in more detail with our special guests shortly, most banks are more concerned about minimising their risk than yours. So what you may not know is that you're at risk of losing your house if all of your properties and loans are cross-securitized with the one bank. A serious risk that's rarely discussed that may also have the flow-on effects of reducing your capacity and your flexibility to do what you want with the properties, but more on this later. 
So from our perspective, your finance and lending strategy and structure is mission critical to your property success. And working with an experienced and savvy mortgage broker right from the get-go, before you even start looking at a properties, is absolutely essential. So how do you structure the best loan solution for you? And how can you select and separate a great broker from the average low-rate loan broker or bank? Well, this is where today's returning guest, Laurie Moore, comes to your rescue. Because this week, we're going to help you answer all of these questions as we continue with part two of our great salt conversation with Laurie, who I'm proud to say is one of Nihau's award-winning senior finance broker partners, or finance architects as we keep calling ourselves, and in my humble opinion, he's an expert at designing the best loan structure, strategy and solution to suit you. Now last week we dug into Laurie's own personal journey, and this week we dive into the nitty gritties of property lending and finance broking, so that we can help you to get a much better understanding of what's important to you when it comes to financing your next property purchase or refinancing to reduce your costs, as in the current lending environment, it's never been more important to get your finance and your loans right. So let's dive back in to our great conversation and let's get invested again, Laurie. Hello, Bushy. Thanks for having me back again, Lawrence. Great, mate. Uh, I really enjoyed our uh, part one last week and uh, now we're going to sort of dig deep into uh, subjects that are near and dear to both of our hearts and uh, like where I always like to start with it, this sort of an exercise, mate, is to get you to run through what you think are some of the biggest mistakes that many make around borrowing money to buy property. Well, the biggest mistake people make is, is going directly into their bank, right? So it's uh, the bank's got their own interests at heart, so going directly to them is 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 putting money in their pocket, I guess. I guess you go you go there if if you're happy to pay a higher interest rate or so higher load costs. To uh, to talk about it from that perspective, um, you don't really you've got money to burn, I guess. Uh, and you uh, you don't really care about the consequences, then go directly to a bank. <laughs> well, and if you if not. If you, if not, then if you've got the time and the energy and the expertise, compare forty plus lenders and two thousand plus load products. Then, um, then, then I can assure you it's a full time job because I do it. I do it all the time. So don't try to take it on yourself. Um, so, so that's probably one of the biggest mistakes. Either going to the bank or or trying to do it all yourself. Um, the others sort of looking at, at at lowest lowest rate versus lowest cost. So it's not always the case that the, the lowest interest rate is is the best loan. Um, there's other aspects associated with that, such as uh, the fees and charges and offset accounts that can help save you money over time um, and help you save your tax over time too. If it's if it's an investment property as well, so getting that getting that done properly. And there's also uh, the other aspects around capacity. Um, uh, so you're going to your own bank is going to just give you one answer in terms of capacity. Uh, looking across a broad range of banks and lenders is, is going to give you a completely different sphere of uh, of what is actually possible. And um, other lenders are prepared to take on more risk than, than others and have different policies. There's so many different variables, and every person's uh, situation is unique. Uh, and 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 you've got to try and match that with the right lender to get the best possible outcome in terms of price and in terms of um, capacity. So I think you know that's. It's a it's a mistake not to not to be have someone on your team to be able to do that for you. Um, we talk about cross securitization. Well, that's probably a bit of an industry term, isn't it? But it just means tying up all your properties with with your loans, so that when once you uh, um, want to sell a property or transact on one of your properties, you find you can't do that without a lot of um, unnecessary administration and or that you can't do it at all because the bank says you can't because everything's tied up together. So it's really important to not make that mistake and make sure that the loans are, are all standalone against properties so that you can still transact on those properties um, independently. Uh, rainy day reserves, I guess, people um, probably don't often consider that. I probably would be guilty of that in the past as well, where not don't set enough money aside to ride out the, the highs and lows of, of, of being a property owner. Uh, having having all loans with one bank is a bit a bit risky. Sometimes it works okay, but most of the time um, it's not the case. And um, potentially, potentially, it could be as bad as being having co cross co, co, co securing your properties. Yeah, uh, because uh, the the bank can can if you've got them all with one bank, they can still treat them. In some cases, it's rare, but it does happen, right? Where they can where they can uh, uh, treat as if it is, even even if it's not co secured. Um, 
Yeah. I think another thing I've seen people do do quite a bit who might have bought their first investment properties when they haven't um, had the knowledge around this is they might have paid down their home loan a bit and uh, and they think, oh, a bit, we've got some equity, we've got some money in redraw, let's go and take this money out of redraw and that can be a deposit on our um, on our on our first investment property, but that's a mistake because that money's not, not tax deductible, right? So the money's coming out of an owner occupied home loan. Um, it's difficult to make it tax deductible. So, so that's so uh, you don't want to be doing that. You need to be setting up a, a separate facility for investment purposes that can be used for uh, uh, sort of, you know, in, uh, easily easy, easily explained to the tax man at the time when you when you're coming to make your, your tax deductions. Yeah, exactly. And then it's sort of, I guess the only other thing is staying with the bank forever and not refinancing, negotiating with them regularly. I mean, I've seen some unbelievable, I mean, I did this with a family member recently and they were just astounded. We we went, we, well, like, we couldn't really refinance them, but they hadn't spoken to their lender for, for, for about five years and they were 2% higher than, than the, or almost on a standard variable rate, which pretty much no one's on, or so I thought, and they were paying 2% more than, um, than what I should have, so it was just a quick, quick phone call in, and you know, rate right gets dropped, and a much better result. So there's a there's yeah, there's I think there's a fair bit of that, and just staying staying too loyal to to one bank for too long is um it's going to cost you money. Yeah, and I think that's a big one actually, because the, the sleepers out there, Laurie, are the the ones that concern me. It's like, and, and I think that the perceived headache and hassle of oh god, I've got to go. Get all this paperwork and go all th- through the rigmarole, and and you know I all, already can't scratch myself because I'm flat out work, and then after hours of looking after the kids and and all of that yeah. stuff that, that goes with that uh, is, is a bit of a hurdle that gets in the way. But the amount of money that people are costing themselves by sticking with the bank, uh, and 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 on similar uh, lines to that too, Laurie, yeah, I'd like your thoughts on this as well, but. Uh, what a, a lot of people, uh, I don't think, realise is that lending policies are changing almost by the day and the week. Uh, mm-hmm. So just because a bank says no, no now doesn't mean that you shouldn't be revisiting it on a regular basis because things are changing constantly. And it's not a, a set in stone exercise that if, if no one can say no, uh, say yes now, that doesn't mean it's locked away forever. It's a, because it's a constantly changing feast and and banks are businesses like everyone else and therefore are often very competitive and things at times are tough. They'll find ways of being able to borrow money because it's a big big part of their uh, income streams. Uh, I think that uh, regular revisiting, whether you're refinancing or, or looking at it, is something that if, if people aren't doing, they're potentially costing themselves a lot of money. And when yeah. we're talking not just biscuits, we're talking thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars uh, over the longer term, if they're then on top of that, so you know, I, I guess you come a lot of stuff there. Um, if we, without going into the infinite detail, um, given those mistakes, what are, what are some of the best ways to overcome them? You think? Well, I guess it probably is just the the opposite to what I said, really, isn't it? It's uh, it's 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 a it's it's using a broker. Um, you know, seventy percent of loans now, I think, are written by or more mortgage brokers. So. People have already looked at their feet as far as that is concerned. Yeah. Um, well, we've got access to 40 lenders. We've got that you, know, you multiply that across a number of products, and there's thousands of lead, load solutions that can help to um, maximize your capacity or minimize and cost of, cost of risk, I guess. Um, just making sure that it's that the structure is right because the structure is going to be the key into making sure that you you pay with the lowest amount as possible that you that you that you're um, that, that it's, so it's costing you as little as possible and that you're not opening yourself up to risk, I guess. And then also you're, you're in the most tax advantageous uh, position in conjunction with uh, be talking with your accountant about that, of course. But that's certainly, you know, the, we have lots of experience around that, so making sure that that's the case. Um, like I guess that standalone loan structure as well. We talked about cross-securitization, uh, making sure that you know, we, we, we stick with standalone securities and minimise risk across that way. Yeah, let, let, perhaps, let, let's dive into that one a little bit because that, that, that's one yeah. one of the most common ones that I see people not getting their heads around. And, and again, it's, yeah. it's very difficult for us to explain that verbally. But uh, and, and add to this if you can, Laurie. But uh, very simply, uh, ideally, if you're going to the extreme of uh, risk protection and, and 
maximizing your uh, capacity. Uh, each property would have its own separate loan without any uh, ties to any other property or any other loan. Yep. And in some instances where it's appropriate, having each each property have a different lender attached as well. So there's not one lender who potentially has got control over the, the whole portfolio. Uh, as, as you said a couple of times, it's you know, you've got to look at that on its merits and, and weigh the pros and cons there. But uh, certainly that standalone structure then allows people to buy and sell properties out there will not at the bank's control because, as we all know, if a bank, uh, if it's cross-securitized and the bank does and you want to trigger a change, either sell or buy a property, then the bank will automatically revalue everything. And if uh, the bank value is being conservative at the time or the market's down and suddenly you don't have the equity to do what you want to do, then suddenly you're, you're locked out. Whereas going standalone, you decide what, what to do with the properties and what you're going to do with the loan. So it's putting more control back in the in the hands of the property owner and the investor. You, any other thoughts around that one? Yeah, I think that stand that standalone structure. I mean, you've summed that up pretty well, mate. The standalone structure is is something that um, we will always try to do. Like, like a number of times, I've I've had people come to me where, where the work has been pretty lazy and just gone all the loads with one bank and everything's cross co secured across um, multiple properties. And that's the first thing you try and do is to unwind that for them um, and put them in a better position to be able to make decisions moving forward because it might not be that you want to sell a property now but at some point that's going to happen whether that's from personal personal for personal reasons or for investment reasons or a myriad of reasons that could come up so you want to make sure that you you your you low portfolio is best structured uh, to enable you to to, to to act as quickly as possible rather than have, have to go through a whole whole set of hoops in order to uh, achieve what you want. So, so yeah, I think that's a key. Look, the other things that we we'll probably need to talk about is making sure you've got that those rainy day reserves as well. Uh, yeah. Investing in property, just making sure that there's there's six months worth of um, costs set aside, six months worth of income potentially. Um, we can set it doesn't it might doesn't mean necessarily there has to be savings. You can set that up as an as an equity loan against one of your properties. It's an equity loan that has a has a buffer in it. Of uh, thirty 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 thousand dollars or so, thirty or forty thousand dollars, depending on the size of the portfolio. And the- yeah, I know. And that's it. the the important thing to emphasize on that one because people are going, oh, what do you mean I have to take another thirty thousand extra on yeah. the loan? The, the key part yeah. here is that if we've set it up the right way, as as we do, as an interest only loan, then uh, they're not using the money; it's not costing them anything. So uh, that's right. all this is doing is building some fat into the exercise, so that something does go wrong. I lose a job or something against the property or the, the tenant doesn't run, run or whatnot, then they've got, got the uh, low-cost funds to uh, fall back on without costing them anything yeah. interim. So I'd say, that, as you say, building in that contingency and that risk protection uh, to cover yeah. unforeseen events that they're not going to put them in financial stress if, if they have to put in their hand in their savings or, or start pen, spending salary to make that happen. Yeah, that's right. So you're not having to sacrifice your lifestyle, basically. Yeah, so the lifestyle continues on if um, if there's a a period of non tenancy or unexpected cost, you, you've got really access to funds that you can draw on that is not costing you anything whilst it's there because it's sitting in an offset account, um, and and you're paying no interest on it effectively. So um, so yeah, I think uh, so I think that's the other the other thing. Well, there's probably a few other things in there, bushy, but mostly is just making making. We talked about this before, but. Having those regular home home loan health checks as well, and just making sure that, if, preferably every eight eight months, but at the most every two years, that there's a, a bit of a review going on of uh, the portfolio and how it sits, and uh, whether it's it, it should stay the way it is. Well, the start of that really is to is to negotiate directly with the lenders that the the, 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 the loans are with, and um, we can have um, a great variance in results. With, uh, with with different lenders and t- determined by their appetite and their and their pressures on their, their own profits and margins at the time. Um, so in some cases they're happy to to drop the pants if that's allowed to be said on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've got some amazing results for people. Uh, and I talked about one of those before, but it's just incredible. Really, there was there was a period where you know, there was this whole cashback process going through for people to refinance where lenders were offering. Up to four thousand dollars, really, to 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 win your business. So offer you a lower rate, and then then also offer you a cash back. But if you play if you played your cards right, you could you could actually um, 
uh, take advantage of that uh, from from the from what the banks were offering and and, and put the money in your pocket. Um, and I did that for a number of people where I negotiated successful negotiated rates, lower rates, and um, and even if people weren't going to leave the bank or um, could leave because of um, borrowing capacity concerns or something like that, the, the bank has no idea around that. So it's really just playing playing that game a little bit, getting access to lower interest rates, potentially getting a, a cash back for those clients when they would not otherwise have got one. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which way you look at, most of those cashbacks don't exist anymore. There's still a couple of lenders with them, but that's probably a good thing because it was distorting the market a little bit and um, it got a little bit out of hand. They started at $1,000, they went up to $2,000, they increased to to four thousand dollars, and well, one or two lenders offering two thousand dollars per property. So, if you had five properties and you were refinancing all of them, you'd they'd give you ten grand. It was. I, I think you managed to achieve that prep, you didn't? Yeah, I did did get, did manage to get a couple later. It was um, as I said, mate, taking the opportunity while it was there because you know, well, we could see that that was it was short term until someone realised why are we giving away all this money and um, is, what, what, what impact is it having on our margins and our profits? So um, so we did do that. I mean, there was a time there, I think, where I, I I got one client to refinance to two different banks to get the token advantage of, of cash back. So yeah. they had two different, two different lines, a home loan and investment loan. We did a refinance with one lender to get their cash back and we did the investment loan with another lender to get their cash back. So we got two lots of cash back. I think I've done that with a few people, actually, when I think about it. So we have a few of those. So, um, but it wasn't just about the cash back. There was the, it was the cost, the cost of the loan as well. The existing lender wasn't prepared to to come to the party. So um, it was uh, it made sense to do it because you really got to look at that in, the, in our environment now. There's a high level of compliance. So unless it unless it is in your best interest as the client, then we really can't consider it. It's pretty hard for it not to be in your best interest if you if you're getting. Seven or eight thousand dollars in in your back pocket through a through a cashback situation. But, yeah, yeah. But, but, I mean, that, 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 that health checks might as well. I was focusing on there. Yeah, no, that that, that also I, that, the uh, I'm lovely to share any because uh, I, I I've seen you do some uh, amazing things uh, just with some clever uh, structuring and whatnot uh, over time. Do you want to share some of other other examples of some of the approaches that you've utilised to get better outcomes for? For borrowers uh, over the years, well, there's 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 those retention team t- tricks that I talked about. I've um, run retention teams quite a lot and and got great results for people. And then there's multiple cashback side that we talked about. Um, there's 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 also uh, in the look what's happened over the last uh, eighteen months is that interest rates have gone up significantly. I think everybody that would be listening would be well and truly aware of that. And the impact that that's had is that. Borrowing capacities have fallen, fallen away because rates are higher and the, the APRA enforces a buffer on the banks as well. So if interest rates are 6%, then people have to be able to afford it at 3% higher than that, so at 9%. So this has been a bit of a bit of an issue over the last 18 months because rates, because what you can afford today, you might not be able to afford tomorrow because rates have continued to increase every month. Um, rates would go up by quarter of a percent or half a percent. And if, if I did a pre-approval for you today, I, I could never be really sure uh, with some lenders whether you're actually going to be able to fulfil that pre-approval uh, in three months' time if rates had gone up by 0.75%, which which did happen, right? So yeah. that was about choosing choosing lenders that will honour those pre-approvals. There's there was a there's a period there when a the pre approval is supposed to be a place for 90 days. So it should be valid for 90 days. It gives you three months to go out and find a property and get the loan approved, basically. In some cases, that's not difficult, but in the height of the property boom, that was hard because you were competing with a lot of people to, to find property. But at least you had those 90 days to actually find something. And you were guaranteed that if you did find something, the bank was going to honor the pre approval. There were a lot of lenders that didn't do that. So certainly did that for me. It was just about choosing the right banks and making sure that um, there were no surprises if someone was potentially going to bid an auction uh, up to $500,000, $600,000, their whatever it was, and then find that rates had brought up by too much and they couldn't afford it anymore. So so, so did quite a bit of that. Um, and there was also taken advantage of a bit of, uh, of some fixed rates through some non-bank lenders. Yep. So the non the that three percent buffer that I talked about has really only been it's only applicable for for deposit taking institutions. Yep. 
um, uh, because that's what APRA, well, that's who they look after from a compliance point of view. So some of the non-banks, most of them have chosen to follow that guidance anyway, but they are not forced to. So uh, so some of them, especially in the current environment where rates are expected to decrease, not increase, they are, um, they are choosing to take a different approach as far as their buffers are concerned. And there's there's one in one in particular that I've used had a five year fixed rate, which you know maybe you normally might not necessarily recommend, but there are ways there are ways around this which I can talk through if you want to, Bushy. But on that five year fixed rate, they don't have any buffer. So if you take their five year fixed rate, which is currently pretty much in line with variable rates, yep. there's no buffer. So instead of having to afford the loan at nine percent, you're basically affording the loan at six percent. And that gives you a like significant amount of additional borrowing capacity. So uh, I've done that with a few clients, and there's no there's, there's there's no time frame you have to be in that fixed rate. Really, if you wanted to break that fixed rate, and this is sort of the advice I've given to people along the way, is that yes, it's a five year fixed rate, and sometimes it can be costly to get out of fixed rates if if variable rates go down by too much and you're stuck on a higher rate than a variable rate. But at the moment, they're pretty much at parity. So provided we monitor that. And we get you out of that fixed rate. The moment variable rates look like they're going to go down again, you can break the fixed rate, go back on the variable rate. It probably cost you a few hundred dollars. Um, you're back on the variable rate down on that on the down downward path as rates come down. So you're really um, going to be better off um, from that point of view as well. So so I've done that a few times. Is I've had a few instances where we've got um, it's called property share arrangement for siblings, right? Often yep. siblings buy properties together when they're young and seems like a good idea at the time, but it can, and it is, because it gives them, uh, it gets them into property earlier because they can combine their their deposits and their, um, their borrowing capacities. But at some point it gets in the way because they meet a partner and they want to buy a property with a partner or um, they want to buy, they, they no longer want to live together if they've bought together and are living in the property and one, one wants to stay and one, one doesn't. There are a myriad of issues that can uh, that can get in the way of this. So, so but there are ways around that because what happens is as a borrower, you are jointly and severally liable for for a debt. So if you if you take out a loan with your sibling, then all of, all of the cost is associated to you. Because if your sister doesn't pay it back, then you have to pay it back. That's certainly how the banks look at it. So that that can restrict your borrowing capacity because they say, well, again, we know you've got a joint loan with your sister, but really we're going to take that all into account because you um, if she doesn't pay, you have to pay, right? But there's a couple of lenders there who will look at that differently. And they will say, okay, well, it's, a, it's an arrangement called property share, and we know that you own 50% of it, but we also know that the other party is earning an income and they're contributing to this. So we will um, we will apportion that according to the ownership structure. So if it's a joint tenants and they own 50% percentage, we'll only take into account 50% of the debt. Um, and so that puts you in a much better position moving forward in terms of what your borrowing capacity might be to do something independent of your sister or sibling or whatever it happens to be. So it's about you know, t- taking advantage of, of that sort of thing as well. There is there is another product that you can use if you come come to me at the right time, right, where we can actually, if a siblings are wanting to buy something, we can, where we can actually set it up and apportion it properly right from the outset so you don't have to you know, um, utilise that particular part of the, the apportionment down the track when we're looking to do something else. But if, if, if two siblings were coming to me today, I could definitely set the load up in a way through a few different lenders that would enable them to to have um, you know, several lot. Li- well, that's probably using technology uh, terminology now that probably won't make sense. But to have the loads independent of each other, so that um, one is not going to restrict the other's borrowing capacity moving forward. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's really important. And that's a that's a, a I think a lot of people don't get their head around. And, and again, you, you've just demonstrated uh, in in great detail uh, the balance of it. So I've, I've talked to someone who really knows the ins and outs of this. Uh, it's something I wouldn't mind you expanding on too, uh, Laurie, yeah, because this is something that you know we, we constantly come up against, uh, particularly given uh, accountants have been on the front foot in, in strongly suggesting uh, a lot of uh, people buy properties and trusts. And, and as we know, there's really great asset protection uh, with, with trust structures, but does have an influence on the the ongoing holding costs. Can you sort of share with us a little bit of, of some of the things that we need to be uh, looking out for in terms of uh, the the different types of uh, property ownership and, and and entities and what impact that has on 
both the property lending process uh, as well as uh, the other impacts. Yeah, there's um, well, there's a dub- number of different ownership structures that you can have, I guess. So, so if you're talking, most people just buy their house in their own names and it's joined with a partner, and that's perfectly fine. Um, sometimes people set it up and say, "Well, well we I'm putting law deposit." So there's a, a what's called a tenants in common approach, where that someone might own tenants in common, like the sixty percent to one party and forty percent to another, um, and that's perfectly fine as well with most lenders. Um, then you start to get into um, trusts, where you might have, you know, Laurie, Laurie and Stephanie as trustee for the for the Laurie Family Trust. Uh, those things are set up and generally pretty acceptable and, and don't act that much differently. All the lenders are in that space uh, than, than what you would if you just bought it in a personal name. But then you get to the next level, which is which is a company set up. So you might have Laurie Law Proprietary Limited as trustee for the trust, and that's a company. So it's a different entity altogether than the, than the individual under, under, under law, common law. So, you, uh, so, so you, you, from that point of view, you can... Uh, you can have, you can run into some some issues in terms of pricing. Um, the banks, not not every bank will lend you money in that respect. They all, they all play in that space, but they also generally um, see it as a slightly more higher risk. So they'll so they'll charge you a higher interest rate and some more fees on that on that side. And they'll also restrict your borrowing capacity a bit because. Uh, the negative gearing benefits if you're buying an investment property, and that's, it, let's be honest, that's the only way you would generally buy a, a property in a company with a trust, unless you were a doctor who was trying to asset protect or something bushy, but that's a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah. But if you're buying an investment property in, in, in a trust under a company name, then the, 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 because it's in the company name, the company gets the benefits of the tax deductions, not the individual, and the individual. Um, so therefore, the individual's borrowing capacity is going to fall because the bank doesn't take into account those tax deductions when they work out their loan borrowing capacity calculations. So, so yeah, there's some restrictions around that. I mean, there's a lot of there are plenty of people who buy that, and there's a lot of the buy in that in that sort of structure. And there's and there's certainly we get a lot of feedback from accountants, don't we? That um, buy in those structures is advantageous for various reasons, but. But it does come with its with its drawbacks, and it needs to be carefully considered because you want to, if you want to have your uh, borrowing, sorry, your your your, your tax deductions uh, properly um, applied to your income position, then you really want to ensure you, that it's in your individual names first. When you run out of those borrowing capacity deductions, or when you, when you run out of those taxation deductions, then that might be the time to consider. Um, buying in a company and, and going down that path. But there are otherwise, and look, we're not accountants, so we have to be careful about what advice we give with that. And um, I can see Bushy go, thank God he said that. But uh, but it's, uh, but yeah, there's, you know, we can we can certainly help with um, with what we think is possible when you run that by, by your accountant. So, so it's just sort of the guidance as well, because each individual is going to have a different income position. The accountant has that um, you know, the accountant, if they've got an accountant who's, a, who's property savvy, um, they will they will certainly understand that and, and make sure that the structure is correct. Yeah, and I, I think the you know the, the sort of joining the dots between what you share with us there, it's it's important to look at the overall situation. And yeah. uh, as you know, uh, firsthand, different types of ownership entities require different processes. Uh, the, the banks treat them a little bit differently in terms of their risk and potentially cost. It has an impact on capacity at, at times as well. So it's again, it reinforces the need to talk to someone like you, uh, who's very savvy around not just the specific finance exercises, but how that then uh, influences and and is affected by uh, other parts of the equation. So that ultimately, the the borrower is making a decision considering all the facts rather than just just you know. So uh, so extremely well said there, and the uh, I guess that sort of leads beautifully uh, into. Uh, something that I, I would like to briefly talk to you about, and that is uh, for those that are listening to this going, gee, there's a lot more to this whole finance thing than I than I, I thought there was, and now I can really see the merits in, in talking to someone like yourself to really get down to the nitty-gritties of what, what's going to be the best uh, solution for, for them and their, their ongoing journey. Uh, what sort of key things do people need to look out for or key questions you think 
uh, borrowers need to be asking of, of brokers in particular to, uh, to make sure they're actually getting the, the right person that's going to give them the best result? Well, I think, well, can I start with a stat? You know, I was astounded by the other day. Um, well, it wasn't the other day. I think it was late last year, actually. That I was, it was that 22% of brokers were completely inactive over a six month period. Wow. So you, how many brokers are there? Because I don't know the actual numbers. A, I think it's about 70,000 something. 70,000. So over a six-month period last year, 22% of brokers did not write a single loan. It just astounded me, right? So I think that's that proliferation of the one-name band brokers that we spoke about last week and a lot of new entrants coming into the industry and think this, that this is, this is easy. In my, in my view, the barriers to entry into broking are still... Start to low. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you, you can get into it, but that doesn't make you a good broker, right? It's not an easy job. It's not, and there's a lot of experience and knowledge that goes goes into being a good broker. Um, yeah. Takes experience, resilient grit, um, determination. You know, you've, you've you've really got to really really go enjoy getting in and going down rabbit holes and finding solutions um, where there might first appear not to be one. So, so I think. You know, that'd be the first question I'll be asking you about. You know, what what experience someone's got and where what where they've come from, but also be trying to avoid a a, a one man band type of situation where um, someone's trying to, to be uh, all things to to everybody and doesn't have uh, the support of a team around them, such as we have at Mohawk. Um, but uh, I think I talked about this last week. But that having been able to have a team where it enables me to focus and do the things well that I do well and know that someone else in the team is looking after the things that I don't do well is highly advantageous. And there's a, there's a lot of aspects to the job that you really, I don't think you can be fully across all of them. Yeah, yeah no. Extremely well said. And, and, and given that, uh, as we've already mentioned, that bank policies and approaches are changing every week, uh, it means that there's no set and forget in this. So if you're not on top of it and you really don't have your finger on the pulse, then then an unsuspecting borrower can be missing out on opportunities that they don't even know about. So uh, love you sharing that. Uh, the the final question that's always in everyone's lips uh, in terms of uh, you know getting out the uh, your crystal ball and looking at what the future holds. So uh, what what's your read on? Where interest rates and lending policies are, are heading, and and the impacts that's likely to have in the leading the short term. Yeah, well, 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 I feel is that rates have reached their peak, right? I think um, we're at that stage now where most economists seem to agree that that's the case. Although, you know, if you start polling a hundred economists and they'll come up with the same answer, they're probably wrong. So let's see if that one's done. <laughs> uh, I noticed that the Reserve Bank is is keeping quite coy about it, aren't they? And um, and talking about data supporting it and interest rate cuts or what that might be. But but I, I I just feel like, you know, we we went through eighteen months of, of rate increase, you know, the cash rate's gone from 0.1% to four point three five, I think is the current run. Uh, it's a it's a massive it's the biggest increase um, since the early eighties, I think, since the recession when you have to have. So so it's it's been it's been tough. I mean most people, if they'd been only taken mortgages out over the last ten years, have never experienced it. No, all a, a, a fairly tumultuous time in terms of um, people getting used to that. But, but but the good news is, I think we've reached we've reached the people. We'll, we'll certainly see some cuts come. I think later this year. It's just a matter of when. Yep. It could be mid year. It could be towards the end of the year. It just depends on how the data where the data supports that. I mean, I think the lenders have their own mortgage cliff to some degree. Yep. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the mortgage cliff in the, all these festivals coming off fixed rates and why we had a lot of those, didn't we? We had. People getting in 1.89s and 1.99% interest rates fixed in for two or three years, and all of those have either come to an end or will come to an end soon. So that was the interest rate cliff as far as individuals are concerned. But the banks all had that too, because during COVID, they were all getting free money from the from the government, basically at zero percent, and adding their margins to that, which is where the two percent rate comes from, basically. Yeah. Zero. So cost of funds plus two percent margin. So, so they all come out at the end of that because they're all rolling that all over onto um, onto onto normal rates. So, so what I'm seeing in the market as a result of that is that they're currently in margin management mode. Most of the banks, so they're not really offering. They're not steeply discounting as much as what they were even six months ago. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, and the, because of that disappearance of the cashbacks that we talked about before as well, there's less incentives for people to refinance, and the banks are aware of this. So they are. So if, I, if you came to me today as an existing client, and and they said, and you said, look, Laurie, I'm paying six and a half percent. What can you do? And I'd say, well, let me talk to you, bank. And I would go. I would know the best rate that I would be able to get would be around six yeah. percent. So I'll go to the bank and I would say, um, Bushy's got to leave. You give him six and a half percent, uh, and you know I've got to refinance him to this bank, and they're going to offer him six percent. I'll come in and they'll offer six point one five, something like that. They'll go, okay, well we know that there's a cost of cost of refinance, and uh, and we're probably going to retain him if we don't squeeze our margin too much. So they they're sort of playing that sort of game, and I'll see that kind of. Well, I do think that'll change, though, mate. I think um, they all they're in business to write loans, yeah. and, uh, and they and that's how they. That's how, they, that's how they make their, their money through their growth and their mortgage book. So well, the, the competition will come in, and I think that'll be around about the time when the rates start to reduce. Yep. Uh, at the moment, they're doing it through policy policy tweaks here and there. They're, they're, trying to, they're changing little bits of policy here and there just to try and eat out a little bit of extra capacity for people. And I think the other thing that's going to change things is that this 3% buffer that we've got, where if you're at 6% or it goes to, you, you've got a reform at 9%, that only came in because interest rates were expected to increase by so much, right? It's right. to percent. Um, so it, it, I think it'll go down. I, it's only a matter of time. And I think it might be entirely when the Reserve Bank put, uh, puts their first cut in place was when APRA will come out and announce that the 3% buck is no longer relevant because we're now in a downward interest rate cycle rather than an upward in, interest rate cycle. So I can see that changing and that impacting on... Um, of the ability of people to move from lender to lender, but also to take on more to take on more debt if they if that's what they are choosing to do in terms of buying more properties. Um, and but I think the other thing that's happening is there's um, the supply side still recovering, right? So there's still a shortage, real shortage of properties. You know, we've, we've probably everyone's probably heard stuff that's been going on with builders, slow builders under pressure and um, insolvencies, and you know lots of still lots of supply side problems in terms of uh, labour. There's a lot of labour working on infrastructure projects instead of on instead of on houses. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of still increased demand for limited resources in terms of that are required to build houses. So you bring all that together, and there's not a lot of new houses getting built. So there's a lot more competition amongst the existing stock of houses, which is putting pressure on property prices. So I can't really see that property prices are going to go down. I can only continue to go up, coupled with the fact that uh, there's. Um, you know, the, the net migration level is just so high. I, I, I never remember the numbers around this, but it was half a million people. It was like in the city, city of the side of Canberra that came in last year or over the last two years. So uh, it's crazy, crazy numbers. So they've all got to live somewhere. So it puts upward, upward pressure on property prices. You know, but on the negative side, you know, you've got all that ge- geopolitical stuff that's going well. And it will really. So um, who knows whether we're headed for World War Three, mate. I don't want to be doom and gloom about that. But God. This is what going on in Ukraine and the Middle East and Taiwan and all. I don't know how that's all going to play out, but yeah. and what's that from a local point of view? We've got we've got well an election in the states this year, so Trump Trump might be back in. Who knows uh, what that might bring and uh, what sort of um, what sort of world we might live in after that? But Australia's got another election next year as well, so so no doubt there'll be some promises that'll be coming through that. That should be about the time when the interest rate environment starting to improve and. The lenders are back on board, as I'll talk about before, in terms of you know, an increased level of competition. So so uh, let's see what uh, each of the parties can come up in terms of supporting the property industry further. I know that you know, you think about the home guarantee scheme, well, that's, um, that's been huge for first-time buyers in terms of basically the the government acting as your guarantor for a, for a property purchase. And that's 30,000 people a year allowed on uh, access to that now. The property price levels are probably... Just a little bit low, so I could probably see those being increased a bit to um, to enable more people to, to get access to it because it helps in terms of the amount of deposit that people need coming in to get their first home. And of course, you know, if people are buying their first home, well, that means they're buying someone else's home, and um, you know, it moves up the up the property property chain in terms of value and um, just has a more upward pressure on property prices. So if you're thinking about buying investment property, I think you know, now is definitely a good time. Absolutely, and, and you know, sort of uh, putting a circle around that, some pretty positive indicators of where uh, things are heading in that regard. Uh, you know, the old demand supply equation: very limited supply, very strong demand, improving 
uh, lending conditions moving forward. So it's it's painting a a pretty positive exercise. Uh, it, it's certainly uh, indicating that you know if anyone's got an interest and they see an opportunity this year and they want to either buy a home or get into an investment property, then they certainly need to be talking to you uh, sooner rather than later, uh, Laurie. So uh, mate, um, let, let's let's jump into the old infamous ambush round where I give you the uh, blindfold and the cigarette and I ask you the uh, the quick questions that we ask of everyone uh, to kick straight into that, mate. Uh, what's your favourite quote and why? Well, Bush, it was an interesting one, this one, because you could, you, there's so many that come and go on you, but there was, there was a couple I thought about, but I, in the end, I went for uh, a bit of Monty Python. Oh, excellent. The life of Brian, mate, and always look on the bright side of life. <laughs> Uh, if, you, if you can imagine Brian up on up there on the cross, you know, drawing his terminal breath as he talks about at the time, and he's still looking on the bright side. So I, I love that. It's, it's just a reminder not to take yourself too seriously. Beautifully said, mate, and uh, and a great memory there for, from me, and and, and very uh, appropriate uh, uh, on the literary side of the equation. Laurie, what, what's the top book that you recommend we read, and why? Well, if you know me well enough, Bushing, to know that I'm not into self-help books at all, <laughs> which lot with what life be. I talk, think about mindfulness, and I, I immediately fall asleep. So I am uh, I'm not into the self-help stuff. So, but I, I do love a good novel, and um, the problem with novels for me is that it takes me a while to get through them because I'll, I'll get through ten pages and I'll fall asleep. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, it's probably starting to show my age a little bit there. But yeah, there are times, but I mean, it's, it's hard to find a, a, a good break in time, isn't it? Where you can sit through and read a, read a whole book, which I know my wife Stephanie does, but uh, it's not something that I've mastered over time. But but I thought I'd go or William if I can, uh, Bushy. Oh yeah, uh, to uh, 1984. That was a, a an old book. I've read, it's probably about ten years since I read it, but it's a bit. It was a bit of a hard slog. And the reason I chose it is it sort of prophesizes a society controlled by fear of lies. So I think it's really got some relevance in twenty twenty four, given what the various dictatorships that we're currently influencing the world do, and you know our recent experience with COVID. You know, there's uh, there's you know, it was driven by by fear. A lot of that stuff, and, and besides that, I'm a big fan of the Hunger Games, and uh, that that was uh, all William as well in, in its own way. So, uh, so there you go. But that's that's there's a book. Get into it um, if you've got if you really want to fall asleep. Probably don't read that book. Uh, <laughs> well, I like that. That's, yeah, uh, pick these look. <laughs> yeah, some good, some great shares there, mate. So where I always like to finish these is getting you to share a a personal happy habit or rewarding ritual or daily discipline that you think. That you've employed over the time that's contributed uh, most to your success. What, what what would that be? Well, they've cut, they kind of go over the years, don't they? But um, one, one motto I've always sort of stood by that uh, has has stayed with me is is about never leaving till till to, to tomorrow what you can do today. Yeah, basically, on um, some of those times where I get to three or four o'clock in the afternoon, I've, I've got three things to get through. And I know that if I get them done, it's going to mean that tomorrow is going to be a, a brighter day and, and and it's going to be much, much less pressure on. So I will always get myself to get it done um, because otherwise it's a shit show the next day, right? Absolutely. And it, it, you might think, oh, well, it's not going to take me long tomorrow, but it always does. And you always get a thousand interruptions. So yeah, taking that bit of time to, to get it off the table where when you can, that certainly gives you a clean slate to clean slate to start the next day with with some confidence mate so it's a, Absolutely. a timeless classic uh, mate uh, really enjoy the chat if you were to sort of put a bow around this uh what are the the key takeaways that uh, you think uh, we need to take from the conversation but from particularly from a homeowner or reef or yep. that property uh, borrower perspective yep well i think it's some um, en en engage an experienced um a knowledgeable mortgage broker don't be afraid to do that um they can help you on your property journey look for a broker that's part of a tight-knit team um try and steer away from the one-man bands so those that have only been in the industry for a very short period yeah. um never trust your bank because they're going to look after their best interests and not yours i'm paid to look after your best interests that's what i'm here for yeah. uh, make sure any interest in profits really yeah. um if you don't ask you don't get uh regularly review your loans 
or better still, get me to do it for you, or your, or your mortgage broker to do it for you. And and otherwise, it'd be about loan structure. You know, loan structure is important. Yeah. How to ensure your best interests are considered and and maximised, really. And lowest lowest cost doesn't always, lowest interest rate doesn't always equal lowest cost. There are alternative lenders. There's solutions that you probably haven't thought about. Um, don't do co-security as we talked about. Make sure you've got buffers in place and safety nets. Safety nets? Did I say safety nests? Yeah, that, we, Make sure we've got considered those and got them all in place for we'll, them. Um, you know, engage a professional and can and can talk you through that. Who's done it thousands of times and can help help you on your journey. Beautifully said, mate. Uh, wrap that up uh, uh, very neatly. There's a, a lot of gold uh, in, in what you shared with us, mate. So word. Uh, for those that are listening and really resonating with with what you're sharing, yeah, how can they find out more and get more involved, in, mate? Well, look, it's uh, we've got all the socials, mate. So they we've got the. I mean, I'm sure we share all the the, the website details and personal details. But yes, so you can you can. I'm happy for you to drop me drop me the line. Should I share my email address, Bushy? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. So my email address is Laurie, which is L A W R I E at Know how property, so that's K N O W H O W property, know how property property dot com dot au. So you can happy for anyone to email me directly for that. Um, we can we can hook up uh, over the phone, over Google, uh, sorry, over over Zoom, Teams, whatever whatever works. So we'll meet meet face to face if you're in the same location or we'll be in the same location soon. So um, so all that stuff, mate. Hello, well, mate. Uh... Really appreciate it. I feel like we've only really just scratched the surface of the wealth of wisdom that you bring to the table in, in this area, Laurie. So, uh, uh, and, and before we go, I, I, for those that are listening in and are really enjoying the, the conversation, uh, make sure if you've got any other questions that you want to ask of Laurie or, or other other team members uh, and other experts in, in the area, uh, make sure you jump onto the uh, Property Hub Collective Interactive Facebook community where we all get to share with other like-minded, hard-working Aussies in a very safe environment without any fear of it being sold to. So just jump onto Facebook uh, or click on the link in the, the show notes and we look forward to continuing the conversation there. And, and finally, before we go, I just want to ask a big favour of, of everyone watching and listening today that's only going to take a couple of seconds because uh, about only about 71% of you that uh, watch and listen to the Property Hub uh, podcast don't subscribe. Uh, so if you've ever enjoyed our shows and videos, I'd really like to ask you a big favour, and that's to hit the subscribe button because it helps our channel more than you know. And I promise you that the more subscribers we get, the bigger the channel's going to get, the bigger the best are going to get, and the better the content's going to get for, for you to help you moving forward. So uh, thanks again for your time, Laurie. Uh, you've given us some great food for thought. And as always, uh, we, we need to remember to get invested. So thanks, Laurie. Thanks, Bush. See you, mate. Thanks for tuning in to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, your home for property investment insights and inspiration. And don't leave yet until you've taken the next step towards living by design. By getting my award-winning book, Get Invested, absolutely free when you sign up at knowhowproperty.com.au or bushymartin.com.au. And finally, make sure you subscribe to Property Hub to get your weekly dose of Get Invested inspiration along with every episode of Realty Talk, Australia's leading property show for red-hot property investing news and insights, direct from industry leaders and influencers. Remember to always get invested in your knowledge, and I look forward to seeing you next time.